Hi, welcome back to educator.com. This is the first lesson on genetics. Genetics is one of my favorite things to teach in biology because it's all about how you inherited uh, the pieces of DNA that make you who you are. And of course, the environment has a lot to do with the expression of DNA in a person's body or any organism's body. But without that DNA uh, expressing itself, you wouldn't have those raw materials for the environment to act upon. So thanks to the work of Gregor Mendel, um, a monk from the 1800s, a uh, very simple man but intelligent man, we got a, a great head start with figuring out genetics. So he is considered the father of genetics because uh, his work, his really meticulous, extensive work, uh, really did lay the groundwork. 19th century Austrian monk, he would have spoke German. He lived in what is now Czechoslovakia. Um, the world was a little bit different there in terms of territory territories back then um, in the 1800s. Um, but yeah, um, Austrian monk. Experimented with crossing peas, pea plants, in the garden of the monastery. Um, now, I've asked my students this before. Um, what's the advantage to using peas? Well, if he had tried to do this with animals, uh, there would have been a lot of problems. Meaning, um, getting the animals to mate with the ones you want them to cleaning up after them, the expense of having animals, waiting a long time for the animal to be born, the generation turnover takes a lot longer, the complexity of the genetics of an animal. He got lucky with the pea plants. Uh, pea plants, the, the species he happened to use, had pretty predictable um, sort of display patterns for how the genetics is actually shown up, uh, how it shows up in the plant. And you'll see that as we go through some examples with the color of the peas, the shape of the peas, the pot, etc. Uh, but this guy, Mr. Mendel, crossed thousands of plants. So this took him years to do. Um, if he would have just mated a few and saw what happened, like, oh, yeah, I know what's going on. Well, um, it was the amount of times he did it to prove that, yes, this can be um, something that is replicated time and time again, and you get the same kinds of results. That proved his point, his theory about this. So yes, when you look at his data, he crossed thousands of plants. And when we say cross, we mean mated. He took pollen from one, uh, fertilized the flower of the other. And the cool thing about pea plants, in addition to many other advantages that he had, is that every pea plant has male and female parts on it. So that makes it very easy to, to mate them. And he discovered some consistent patterns based on the results of the crosses. Um, you'll see some interesting ratios of, of the offspring, what's expected to have happen, um, you know, when you do these crosses. Thanks to the fact he did it hundreds or thousands of times with these various traits, you get those predictable ratios. And, and we'll talk more about that, how, you know, flipping a coin 10 times, you're not always gonna get um, five heads and five tails. But if you flip it a thousand times, you're going to get closer to the, what the statistics tell you is going to happen. So there is Mr. Mendel. So with his research, there were two laws that um, have a lot of credence still today, but there are some exceptions that I'll tell you about. His law of segregation. Um, segregation socially means something very different. If you try to segregate people, you're um, separating them from each other. Segregation here is talking about gene parts getting segregated. And if you watched um, the cell division lesson on meiosis, you know that there is a separation of duplicated chromatid parts um, that has to do with making sperm, egg, pollen. Um, so that's what the segregation is referring to. Mendel knew that each parent has two units that it could possibly pass on for each trait and, and that these two units were split up in their pollen and eggs. There's a 50-50 chance of inheritance. And so you're going to see that depending on the genotype, you know, whether it's um, uh, dominant, 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 recessive, and that'll make more sense in a little bit, um, only one of them is going to be passed on to the offspring. Because remember, from the chromosome explanation in cell division, if you have homologous pairs, you know, one from your mom, one from your dad, they each gave you one piece of that puzzle. And, and Mendel knew that even though he had never seen chromosomes in his life. He knew that there was something of substance that these plants were passing on in their pollen and egg. So the law of segregation is true. We, we know it's true. The exception is for when non-disjunction occurs. Non-disjunction would be when you have failure of separation during meiosis, failure of homologous chromosomes to separate or the chromatids to separate. And so you end up with too few or too many chromosomes in sperm or egg or pollen and egg, 
that doesn't happen that often. So um, non-disjunction would be the exception to the law of segregation actually happening. The law of independent assortment, a little bit different. Uh, Mendel also knew that each trait is inherited independently from every other trait. Example, just because a pea is green doesn't mean it will be round. Um, so the inheritance of color in peas has nothing to do with the inheritance of shape. Uh, the size of the plant, whether it's tall or short, has nothing to do with the pea pod color or pea pod look. All those things are inherited separately. The one exception is linked genes. So we now know that um, when, when, when you look at complex inheritance patterns that we know more about today, there are these linked genes where they, they're found on the same chromosome and tend to be inherited together. Uh, one example I can think of is um, people with red hair are much more likely to get freckles than people with other hair colors. Uh, that could be due to linked genes having to do with um, getting that particular hair color, um, impacting the expression, uh, the, the chance of getting freckles. But there are lots of examples of linked genes Mendel, Mendel didn't actually get to see that. Um, there was a very simple genetic pattern with pea plants, which I think was a good thing. Um, but, you know, you got to cut him some slack. He was doing this work in the 1800s, didn't have a lot of technology, and he really found out some, some awesome stuff. So some genetics vocabulary. This is the first set of vocabulary I want to share with you so that as we go through the examples of these different uh, genetic phenomena and, and these patterns that we can use these these terms and you know what I'm talking about. A gene, most people know what this is, but it's a segment of DNA that codes for a specific protein. We all know, you know, we, we get our genes from our parents. What it actually is, is a segment of DNA. And if you watch the, uh, the lesson on RNA, you know that RNA is made from DNA and that RNA is translated into protein. And the proteins is what makes the trait. Um, sometimes these traits are visible on the surface of an organism's body, sometimes they're not. But there is some um, manifestation of that DNA in the trait. So that's what a gene actually is. An allele is a component of a gene. Organisms typically have two for each gene. They pass on one to their offspring because of that segregation phenomenon. So we talk about alleles. Alleles are usually called dominant or recessive. And what that means is, if it's a dominant allele, it pertains to the allele that can overshadow or mask another. So if I inherit two alleles from my parents, and this one is not expressed, but this one is, we would call this one dominant, because it's masking. It's not allowing this DNA to be expressed. This is the one that's being expressed. Recessive is the one that can be overshadowed. And so these are relative terms. You're going to see there are exceptions to this dominant recessive thing when we talk about more complex patterns. That's coming up a little bit later. Typically, dominant alleles, they use a capital letter. So if we're talking about gene A, dominant alleles would be a capital A. And then um, for recessive, it would be lowercase. Homozygous and heterozygous. When you inherit two alleles for a gene, the combination is called homozygous or heterozygous. Homo meaning same, zygous coming from that word zygote, which means that first cell of life, the sperm and the egg coming together, or the pollen and the egg uh, coming together. Um, homo meaning same, so they have the same allele for the gene that is now in that zygote. So homozygous could be this. Or it could be this. Or it could be this. So I'm giving you a few different genes. So for gene A, hey, they're both dominant alleles. Each parent gave one dominant allele. Hey, for gene R, both recessive alleles. And these will be expressed. This is the case where recessive, since no dominant alleles have been inherited, those will get expressed. Um, and here's another example. We would actually call this one homozygous dominant just to tell us, hey, the ones that are the same, it's the dominant one. This one we would call homozygous recessive because, hey, the, the ones that are the same are the recessive ones. Those are the two that were inherited. Heterozygous is having the opposite form of alleles for a gene. So here's heterozygous. This is heterozygous. And that's heterozygous. So the two opposite forms, the dominant and the recessive, inherited together. The mom or dad gave each of them, and 
that's how it is. You wouldn't use the term heterozygous dominant or heterozygous recessive. That doesn't make sense. Heterozygous tells you you've inherited a dominant from one parent and a recessive from the other. More vocabulary for you. Uh, we actually just looked at genotypes on the previous slide. A genotype is the specific combination of alleles for a gene. So examples of genotypes. That. That. How about this one? Um, let's go with this one. And I'll give you one that's going to look weird right now, but later on, it won't look weird. This is also a genotype pertaining to blood type. Um, but these should look familiar based on what you saw on the previous slide. They're all combinations of alleles that have been inherited. Um, so these are forms of DNA um, that have been inherited in that new individual. The genotype gets expressed and the actual physical expression of the genotype is known as phenotype. Sometimes phenotype can be seen when you're talking about something like skin color. Whether or not someone has a widow's peak. If you're unfamiliar with a widow's peak, that's an apostrophe. Um, if your hair comes down to a little point here um, in the middle of your hairline, that's a widow's peak. Um, as far as I, I know, that that's caused by a dominant allele, if you have it. Um, another one could be blood type. Now, this is one that you can't tell by looking at someone, oh yeah, you're type A. But there is a physical manifestation, a physical expression of the genes that made this. It's just on the surface of the red blood cell. Um, but all of these are phenotypes, the physical expression of what you inherited up here. Hybrid. There are multiple definitions. The one we're going to use more with this particular lesson is, it's an individual who is the result of crossing two sexually reproducing parents. I'm a hybrid of my two parents. That's how you could use it. It also can mean a combination of two closely related species. Um, for instance, a mule is a hybrid, a sterile hybrid of a donkey and a horse. Um, that hybrid uh, thing will come up in biology occasionally, but uh, with this lesson, we're going to talk about a hybrid as a combination of two sexually reproducing individuals. Pure breeding, also sometimes called true breeding, but pure breeding, the individual is homozygous for a gene, only one kind of allele to pass on for a trait. You're going to see coming up when we talk about peas, a pure breeding pea, if it's yellow, it's only going to pass on the alleles that cause its offspring to be yellow. Um, same with uh, the green pea. If green pea is true breeding, it only has that certain kind of allele. Um, maybe it's wrinkled, so it's true breeding, or sorry, pure breeding for, um, for that wrinkled uh, allele type. All right, so vocabulary associated with the generations. When we cross one set of individuals and get a second group, cross the second group, get a third group, there are names for that. So Mendel started a process for categorizing generations of organisms when tracing inheritance. And he would have kept notes on this to keep it straight, so he knew what generation led to which. The P generation, sometimes called P1, but honestly the one is a little bit redundant. P just means parental generation. A, if we plant these peas, we're going to get the next group. So the parents are here. We're saying, hey, this parent is all yellow. I know it's in black and white, so it's hard to tell, but these are all yellow and these are all green. Uh, so the parental generation, if we take pollen from one and put it on the flower of the other, the offspring are going to be F1 from the P generation. And F1 is first filial. Uh, filial meaning it's you know of the family from the previous generation. And when we cross F1, their offspring are F2. And that pattern continues. If we were to cross F2, the second filial, they'd make F3. You cross F3, they make F4. It keeps going on until F whatever. So yeah, um, you could think of the P generation as grandparents, and then the F1, the parents, and then F2, the grandchildren. But you know what? It's all relative. F2 is just telling you like, hey, it came from two previous generations. And that's why I wrote and so on. Um, you can keep going and going and going and going if you want to see uh, future patterns coming from all the way back from P. Um, you're going to see that th this on the, on the next 
couple slides that this will make more sense what's going on with this expression that in the F2, the grandchildren, that one P looks a lot like the grandparent up here. But in the F1 generation, that green phenotype was hidden. It was masked. Okay, Punnett squares. Um, there was a scientist by the name of Punnett who came up with this way of, of using a square to have a visual representation for the probability of allele inheritance in offspring. Um, let's say in the P generation, we have a heterozygous individual and we're crossing this individual with another heterozygous individual. So you're going to see this a lot through this lesson. This X just means we're mating those two and these are their genotypes. The phenotype doesn't really matter here. I just want to show you um, what, how the gene uh, inheritance occurs with respect to this Punnett square. So you put one individual on one side and you separate the alleles here and here. This is kind of acting out that segregation phenomenon. During meiosis, you get a splitting of those chromosomes. Uh, this is saying that, hey, if that's the male individual, half the sperm are going to have inheritance of this. Half the sperm are going to have this other allele in it. Or pollen. If we're talking about a plant, half the pollen grains have this, half the pollen grains have that. And the other parent is the same. We put that parent's alleles here and here. Um, this is just how it is. One parent's on the top of this four square Punnett square. And the other parents on the left, um, you don't put them here or here. That's just how it is. And it doesn't matter where you put the male and female. The male or female could be here and vice versa. And then you show how they come together. It's, it's accounting for all the possibilities of inheritance. So these two gametes, you know, pollen and egg can combine. These two combine. And so on. So what this is saying is, A... There are four possibilities. There's a 25% chance of the offspring being homozygous dominant. There's a 50% chance, two out of four, of it being heterozygous. 25% chance of it being homozygous recessive. So the genotypic ratio for the F1. And if these are the P generation, which are here, this is telling you what's going to happen in the F1 that come from them. So the genotypic ratio is one to two to one. That's like saying 25%, 50%, 25%. Here's what I'm saying. I'm saying, hey, one, to two, to one. And this ratio will come up again and again. Um, some people like writing fractions. It's just another way of representing the chances of this happening. Now, keep in mind, if you were to have only four offspring, you're not always going to get half of them with heterozygous. Because I mentioned this earlier, if you flip a coin four times, are you always going to get two heads and two tails? No. But if you keep flipping that coin... Statistics tell you that as time goes on, you're more likely to get the 50-50 ratio. Um, so if we were doing this with peas and we planted, you know, four peas to see what happens, well, it's possible we get the perfect one to two to one, but every time inheritance happens, every time a pollen grain and egg combine, you get this being reenacted over and over again in terms of the probabilities. So if we planted a hundred peas, or 500 Ps, it's much more likely that it's going to be close to that 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. Okay, monohybrid cross is t telling us we're focusing on one gene, mono singular, hybrid combination, cross is the, is the mating. So it's tracing the inheritance of one gene. So Mendel started by mating pure breeding Ps in the P generation, no pun intended with the P. Um, so homozygous dominant for this color gene um, because he's focusing on color this time. He focused on other traits, um, you know, the size of the plant, etc. But we're focusing on the color of the P. We're going to we're going to call it the Y gene. And that happens a lot. Geneticists will um, assign a letter based on the dominant phenotype. You don't have to. I mean, if you want, you could use A for this gene, uh, but we're using Y for yellow. So pure breeding means, hey, this plant all of its peas are going to look yellow. It's only going to pass on dominant alleles. 
this plant, all of its peas are green. And because there's no dominant allele, if it was heterozygous, big Y, little y, it actually would look yellow because the, this allele dominates that. So when you mate them, actually, I don't want to use green because I don't want to confuse you about the green pea thing. So here's the, the pea generation. So this is the pea generation of peas. And when you do a Punnett square, Oh, surprise, surprise. They're all going to be heterozygous. And what will they look like? They'll look like this parent. Because at least one Y allele, the big one, the, the dominant one, will um, mask this recessive one. And so the heterozygous individuals look just like this one. So they're all... heterozygous and they're all going to look yellow 100% chance now we're going to take these F1 individuals the F1 all yellow all heterozygous and mate them and I realize that they're pea plant siblings that's not a big deal when it comes to plants it's, it's a different kind of thing when it comes to humans of course but um, we're going to mate the F1 generation and see what happens so for the F1 cross, two heterozygotes were mated. Both, well, all of them, are going to be heterozygous looking yellow. So. It's going to be a little different this time around. Twenty five percent chance of homozygous dominant, fifty percent chance of heterozygous, and twenty five percent chance of homozygous recessive. So in the F two, the genotypic ratio is what? It is one to two to one. One homozygous, two out of four are going to be heterozygous. One out of four is homozygous recessive. However, the phenotypic ratio its going to be a little bit different. It's going to be three to one. Why? Because these three all look yellow, but this one looks green like its grandparent pea plant. Um, so yeah, that's that's the interesting thing that now when we look at the genotype versus phenotype, there are some differences uh, because in this particular case with heterozygous, only the dominant allele is being expressed and the recessive one is being ignored. You're going to see in the future in this lesson, there are some cases where with a heterozygous individual, the recessive is also expressed but that's not complete dominance like we're seeing here. Um, so there are your ratios in the F2 generation, uh, the, the grandchildren peas uh, from the P generation with this monohybrid color cross. Now with a dihybrid cross, we're gonna trace the inheritance of two genes at the same time. That's why it's dihybrid. So Mendel did this, uh, he simultaneously traced P color and shape. So I'm introducing a new designation for you. Um, now, as a shortcut, instead of writing, you know, more than this genotype, I'm just going to write big Y blank, meaning that blank, whether it's a dominant Y or recessive Y, same thing in terms of what phenotype you get, because that one dominant is going to be expressed, and whether the other one's a dominant or recessive, it's going to look yellow. Like we also saw before, both recessive, homozygous recessive, codes for green, the phenotype. Now, with shape of P, getting at least one dominant allele for the R gene is going to make the P's round, like we're used to seeing when we eat P's. But if no dominants are inherited and it's homozygous recessive, you're going to have wrinkled P's. Let's see what happens when you mate the pure breeding plants. So 
he first did this, he knew based on previous um, observation that, oh, this plant, completely pure breeding. Regardless of what I made it with time and time again, it's always making yellow round peas. And he mated it with this one. So this one, always yellow round. Here's the phenotype. And this one, oh, look, it's wrinkled. So it's always making that wrinkled green one. And hey, when you mate them together, we don't even have to do a Punnett square for this. You're always going to get this. Heterozygous for both genes. And what's it going to look like? Check this out. Look back here. It's going to look like this, like that parent, even though the genotypes are different. So here's what you have in the F1. All of the F1 generation looks like that and has these genotypes. What happens when you mate F1 when it's heterozygous for both genes? You need to do a very large Punnett square for that. That's coming up next. Here's the dihybrid cross example in terms of mating those F1 individuals. So like we said, we're mating this times two. I'm writing that kind of small because I got to have room to write um, the different um, pollen and egg um, allele combinations you're going to get. So if we account for everything, here's what ends up happening in the pollen grains. That's all the possible combinations. And the way you can keep track of that is... And, and this is just makes sense in my head. Um, since you have to account for every possibility, I just make two little dots next to every um, letter. And once there's two dots, you, you know you're done. Here's what I mean. So we could have that one and that one combining, right? Okay, that's one pollen grain possibility. We could also have this one and that one. So now we know we're done with uh, the dominant Y. We could also have this one combined with this one. Hey, and we also could have this one combined with this one. And those are all the different possibilities. So since the other parent has the same genotype for both the color gene and the shape of the P gene, it's the same. All right. Now, it would be really exhaustive to write out the genotypes for all of these. So instead, let's just keep track of the phenotypes. Okay, so for the first one, first couple, I'll, I'll write the genotype. So yeah, this one is going to look like that grandparent because having that pollen grain combined with that egg or having you know this pollen grain combined with that egg, you're going to get that. And what are they going to look like? Well... Gonna look like that, right? Now for the rest of them, up on the top row, because of this, the fact that you're always in, in this part of the Punnett square, you're always going to get a dominant Y and a dominant R. The rest of these are all gonna be round and yellow, regardless of what they inherit here. You know, even though this particular combination is gonna be heterozygous, like those two parents, it's still gonna be uh, yellow and round. This one, its genotype would be like this. Still, they all look identical. On the same token, this whole left column, all yellow and round. So far, a lot of yellow and round for the same reasons. When this particular gamete is inherited with these, hey, all yellow and round. But hold on, we'll get some varieties. This one right here, you definitely have the yellow color, but oh, little r, little r, homozygous recessive for shape. Looks almost like popcorn, but that's your wrinkled pea. <clears throat> this one here, yellow and round. <gasps> oh, we have another wrinkled yellow. Yep, yeah, because there's no dominant r, but there is a dominant for y. Next up. 
Yep. Round and yellow. How about this one down here? Oh, it is also a little popcorn looking one. Has a dominant allele for color, but not for shape. And here's where we finally see some green peas. Check it out. No dominant allele for the Y gene, but it is round. So we're going to have a green round pea like I'm used to eating <laughs> here. What do we have? Eh, it's round and green. Different genotype from this one, but same phenotype. And here as well. Oh, and then our last one, completely recessive for both genes, wrinkled and green. Oh, look at that. It's kind of purdy. Writing a genotypic ratio for this would be kind of a waste of time. It would be a lot of numbers and a lot of colons. Um, it's more meaningful to talk about the phenotypic ratio. So in the F2 for this dihybrid cross, the phenotypic ratio equals, well, how many yellow round peas? Nine. How many yellow wrinkled peas? Three. How many round green? Three. And how many wrinkled green? One. Nine to three to three to one. Of course, that number is going to equal 16 because that's all the possible combinations. This is a famous ratio that Mendel came up with. He did dihybrid crosses with a lot of different traits, not just uh, pea color, pea shape. He could have done it with um, flower position and pea plant size. He could have done it for pea pod shape, pea pod color. Um, the point is, is that when you do this with a dihybrid cross with both um, particular individuals being heterozygous in the, in the parental generation, or in this case, in the F1 generation, um, you're going to get this interesting phenotypic ratio. We just talked about complete dominance previously, meaning when you get this, it's going to look yellow, right? This one isn't even expressed. That's known as complete dominance. That does not always happen in genetics. Sometimes, inheritance of the heterozygous genotype, both alleles are expressed together. That's called incomplete dominance. Blended inheritance is what uh, another term for it is. Um, blending of, of alleles or blending of genes. A good example is snapdragon flower. So here's a pink snapdragon uh, flower on a snapdragon plant. We're going to start with the P generation. The P generation is going to be And we use R for red, uh, but this is with the color. The, the P generation, we have pure breeding red with pure breeding white. So looks red. This one looks white. Now, normally, if you cross these with complete dominance, all the offspring be heterozygous and red. But in this case, that's not what happens. So the cross with the P to make F1. All of F1 is heterozygous and pink. They're all pink like this one. So this one's heterozygous. It's definitely a blending, just like if you combine red and white paint, you get pink. Um, so both parts of the DNA uh, on, on each chromosome are expressed, and you get this uh, collective um, pigment combination that equals pink. What, what about when we take the F1 pink individuals, take pollen from one, excuse me, um, and egg from the other, and combine them? So here's our F1 cross. Okay, like we saw before, once again, genotypic ratio, 1 to 2 to 1. No surprise there. But what's the phenotypic ratio here? Is it 3 to 1? No, it's not, because these individuals are pink. So both the genotypic and phenotypic ratios for F2 
are one to two to one, one red to two pink to one white. So there's incomplete dominance. This actually happens a lot um, in human genetics as well, uh, where there's a blending of traits from you know both parents to have something that's kind of in between in the offspring. Epistasis. This is a phenomenon in genetics where a gene has the ability to completely cancel out the expression of another gene or genes. Um, it kind of trumps uh, the other genes. Like in certain games of, of cards, you'll have a trump card where that's the one, hey, I can beat every hand or I can beat every other card with this. Well, with albinism, the gene that causes albinism to occur, it cancels out all the other genes that relate to skin color. So um, let's assume there are, um, let's say there's four genes for skin color, okay? Let's say skin color genes A, B, C, and D. But the epistatic gene, the one that can cause albinism, you can see an example here, is gene E, E for epistasis. If you're wondering, like, what literally is albinism? It's the inability to make melanin. Um, so this individual, no melanin. That's the pigment that is in uh, your skin, hair, the irises of your eyes. Um, they just cannot make it in their melanocytes, the cells that would normally uh, produce that pigment. And it's because they've inherited with this gene, this genotype, homozygous recessive can cancel out all of those. It does, regardless of how much dominant alleles you've got with those four skin color genes. So I'm gonna give you three examples of people uh, with inheritance of, of these five genes and we'll talk about what they look like. So person number one, person number one with skin color, They've inherited this. Now remember, these are the names of the genes, but you inherit two alleles for every gene. So there's all eight alleles for the four genes, and they've inherited this. So what do they look like? Are they albino? No. Because of the fact that this is homozygous dominant and not homozygous recessive, you're not going to get those turned off. So what is the skin color like for this person? Um, fairly fair skin. Um, not as fair as if they were all recessive, but there's a lot more recessive alleles than dominant alleles. Um, maybe, you know, maybe close to my skin color, it's hard to say, but um, this person is not albino. How about this individual? Darker skin than the first individual and no albinism. They, they don't have the homozygous recessive case that would cause them all to be canceled out. So you get expression of these four genes. Both of these people, not albino. Now, I do want to introduce you to one other term that's going to come up again later in this lesson. The fact that this individual has that one recessive allele they are a carrier for albinism. If they were to mate with someone else with the same genotype, they have a 25% chance of passing on albinism because here's that, that one out of four chance that those recessive alleles come together. These three individuals, if, if that actually occurred with their offspring, not albino. They might be a carrier as well, but Nope, these people, uh, when you have these genotypes, not albino. This one would be albino. So here's the third example. You can probably see where I'm going with this. Yep, so because of this genotype in the epistatic gene, all of these are not expressed. Now, if they had one of these genotypes, this person would have very dark skin. They have the maximum amount of dominant alleles for these four skin color genes, but they're not going to be albino. Or sorry, they are. I, I misspoke. They're not going to have skin pigment because they're going to be albino because of this epistatic gene.
There are also other uh, factors that can impact your skin color, of course. The environment, uh, the amount of sun you get will make melanocytes more active. Um, the food you eat, um, your health level, there's various factors that can impact um, the color of your skin, but there definitely are genetics behind it. And this is an example of how one gene can impact a bunch of others. Multiple alleles. We've talked about cases where you have a dominant and a recessive, and those are the only two varieties. But it's a little more complicated than that. With certain genes, there aren't just two forms of alleles. There can be more. An example, human blood types. There are really, really rare blood types, like one in a million kind of blood types that I'm not going to discuss here. I'm going to talk about the four main um, letter types. For now, we're going to ignore what's known as the RH factor. That's whether you're um, you know, positive or negative. I'm O positive, so I got a dominant allele um, that affected m the surface of my, my red blood cells. The RH factor is inherited via a different gene. So I'm going to ignore that for now. We're going to talk about the four main blood types, A, B, O, and AB. So there are three allele types here. Here they are. That dominant, this other dominant, and that recessive. What's with the eye? Well, this is showing you that, hey, these both are dominant alleles. One is the A form, one is the B form. They are equally dominant over that. That's why they both get a capital I. If instead of this, if we just wrote A and B and wrote little a, you might think that's simpler, but the reason why this is more confusing is you might think that, oh, you know, since that's a dominant B and that's a different letter, it doesn't have the ability to overshadow it like this one does. So to keep it straight, the geneticist who first, you know, came up with this designation, <clears throat> they said, hey, we're going to pick I as the letter representing whether it's dominant or recessive, and we have a superscript saying, hey, this is the A version, this is the B version. They both can mask the recessive here. So with blood types, let's look at if you have phenotype A, the A blood type, whether you're RH positive or RH negative, if you're A, there are two possibilities with inheritance here. You could be with your genotypes. homozygous dominant for A, or heterozygous for A. Okay, so both of these people have the same exact red blood cells. Their phenotype um, is identical. It is complete dominance here with that allele. Now B, you can probably guess what's going to happen. Homozygous dominant for B, also they could be, they could be B, <laughs> heterozygous for B. There you go. With AB, there's only one genotype, and it's this. I've heard this phenomenon, I've heard this phenomenon, phenomenon being referred to as codominance because both alleles are, are dominant and they're both being expressed at the same time. Neither one overshadows the other. Um, the combination of these is not a blending, like you saw with incomplete dominance. Uh, they're both expressed on the surface of the red blood cell. And then there's one other genotype, and it's the one that causes O. To inherit the homozygous recessive case gives you O blood. Let's do some Punnett squares. Now, this is the one for me. This is how I got my blood type. And a lot of times when you do a Punnett square for how you came from your parents, it's hard to know exactly what their genotypes are, but I know for a fact what my parents' genotypes are. And it's not because I did an expensive DNA analysis test or something. I'll explain why I know. So my dad is A, so I know he's got that, that allele going on. My mom is O, so here's my mom. Here's my dad on the male side, female side. I know for a fact my dad is heterozygous. Excuse me. Why do I know that? Because I got O blood. So if my dad has A and my mom has O, I couldn't have inherited O blood without me getting this allele from him. So yeah, normally I'd write homozygous recessive, homozygous recessive genotype, but instead this time around, I'm just going to give you the phenotype. O and O. There was a 50% chance of me getting O. Turns out that my one sibling, my brother, 
He's A. So him and I are like a perfect statistical example of how, hey, there was a 50% chance of my parents passing on A blood and a 50% chance uh, passing on O. It's, it's a one-to-one -one ratio or two-to-two -two if you don't reduce it. Kind of interesting. Um, yeah, if my dad was homozygous dominant for A, both me and my brother would have A blood for certain. Uh, the only way that wouldn't be true is if while I was developing in the womb, there was a random mutation at that exact spot on DNA that codes for this, but the likelihood of that is very, very slim. One more Punnett square for blood type. I want you to, to think of this, and if you need some extra time, just pause and, and, and look at it for a sec. But I want you to tell me, why is this Punnett square really interesting? when a heterozygous person with A and a heterozygous person with B blood mate. What's interesting about that? Yep, it's a 25% chance of getting each of the major blood types. Look at that, it's a one-to-one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one -to -one ratio uh, of all the different blood types. Question for you, can a blood type be used to prove that someone is the parent? No. To prove that someone is the parent of a child, you'd have to do a more extensive DNA fingerprinting kind of analysis, um, which you can hear about more with the, uh, the DNA lesson in this course. But can a blood type be used to prove that someone is not the parent? Yes, sometimes it can. Um, for instance, if we look back at my Punnett square, if I had B blood, then... <laughs> one of my parents is not the actual parent um, because that can't happen. Um, but you can't use blood type proofs that someone is the parent because there are billions of people, um, at least hundreds of millions, uh, with that blood type the same as yours. Polygenic inheritance, the name says it all. Poly, meaning many, genic, many genes. It's when um, traits, and there's actually a lot of traits that get this, many traits get their phenotype from the inheritance of numerous genes. So we were looking at a simple, um, you know, one gene mode of inheritance up until this point. This gene causes this trait, that other gene causes this other trait. But oftentimes, especially when we look at humans, it's numerous genes inherited that together um, give you a certain phenotype. Human skin color, that's an obvious one. We looked at um, that particular example with epistasis, that you can have lots of varieties with the, uh, the number of dominant alleles and recessive alleles. Hair color, there's not just two hair colors or three hair colors. There's a lot of varieties. And yes, environment can impact that, um, but hair color definitely caused by more than one gene. And height, there's not just tall and short and medium size. There's a, a whole rainbow of heights. Uh, and sizes and shapes with humans. So let's look at height in terms of, um, you know, why can someone like myself be taller than both parents? Um, I'm about an inch taller, inch and a half taller than my dad, um, and so is my brother. You can also have cases where the adult child from two parents ends up being shorter than both parents, besides, you know, malnutrition and, and health problems. Sometimes your genes, you know, they give you a predetermined height possibility. How does that happen? Well, let's pick, um, hmm, let's pick R, S, T, and U. So these are the four genes. These are the height genes. It's completely arbitrary why I picked those letters. I just didn't want to do A, B, C, D again. Um, well, hey, uh, there's T for tall right in there, but let's say there are four genes that really impact your height. Um, so here I've got two parents and, and they're, they're medium size. Let's say uh, they're, you know, the, the father is five, nine and the mother is, uh, five, five. Okay. So we've got them both being heterozygous for all four genes. And if you're wondering, why did I say that the, the female is uh, a little bit shorter um, as, as average than the male? Well, um, testosterone, um, a, a primarily male hormone, tends to impact um, growth 
um, of, of men, a little bit differently than women. Um, you know, the average height of women is, is shorter than men. Um, if they mate, chances are, it's, it's more likely, they're going to have somebody with a very similar phenotype to them because they're probably going to inherit a lot of heterozygous possibilities with these four genes. However, it's possible they could have a child with this. Look at that. If you do a Punnett square for each one of these in your head, you can see that for the R, for this to be inherited, you know, because these are the parents, here's the P, and here's the F1. There's a 50% chance of this happening. With S, 50% chance of this happening. With T, 25% chance of that happening. With U, 25% chance. So yes, this is less likely. And you can see that only two dominant alleles may be shorter um, than dad and mom. Uh, if this is a boy, might be the same height as his adult mother. Um, if this is a girl, uh, she might be shorter than mom as well. Here's another possibility. They could actually have a son with this, or a daughter with this. I made that. <laughs> I made this look like, there we go. It looked like lowercase at first, but look at that. This uh, daughter or son has all dominant alleles except for one. Seven of the eight alleles, dominance. It's possible. Less likely than some other combinations, but a 25% chance of that, 50% chance of the S inheritance. This is 25% and that's 25%. So chances are they're not going to have a lot of kids like this, but this individual would be taller than both parents. So this is an example of how you can get, you know, this wide variety of phenotypes happening because of polygenic inheritance. With one gene causing one trait to occur, you tend to get less phenotypes. With a test cross, um, speaking of phenotypes, let's say we have uh, sheep. In the case of complete dominance, so let's say that uh, sheep fur color you know, with, with black or white sheep, they have a case where this or this both equal black and this equals white. When you look at a black sheep, you can't tell what their genotype is. Because before I actually listed it as that, I said, hey, you know, that, that codes for black, right? The fact that you could have homozygous dominant or heterozygous, you can't visually tell. So how do you figure it out without doing an expensive genetic test? How do you figure out what that other allele is? Are they homozygous dominant or heterozygous? Well, you do what's, crawl, what's called a test cross. You take a white sheep and you mate them together. If this particular black sheep is homozygous dominant and they mate with the white one, all of their offspring will also have that black wool. You could have them mate eight times, 12 times, 20 times. You're always going to get black wool offspring. However, if, you can probably guess what's coming here, if they're heterozygous, approximately half will be black and half will be white because it's a 50-50 chance of inheriting the dominant or recessive uh, with that heterozygous individual. So a test cross is a way to kind of show what genotype is going on there that you can't tell by just looking at the individual. Sex link traits. We've, we've talked about a lot of things that have very little to do with male or female um, other than the fact that you have a male and female parent. Um, you know, epistasis impacts men and women equally. Um, hair color, something both men and women inherit in the same way. But sex link traits can impact things that happen in females a little bit differently than what happens in males. Here's some examples. So some alleles are inherited on sex chromosomes. When we talk about the 46 chromosomes in humans, most of them are autosomes or autosomal chromosomes. These are non-sex chromosomes. That would be 22 pairs 
which is, of course, 44 chromosomes. There are a total of 46 chromosomes um, in our uh, species. Most of them have nothing to do with being male or female. However, when you look at the X and Y chromosome, it's one pair. And that's two total chromosomes, and that equals the 46. Women are XX, men are XY. There are some other varieties um, where you can inherit too few X, uh, sex chromosomes or um, too many, and that's covered in the second genetics lesson. You can check that out. But um, X and Y are the two sex chromosomes. And actually with uh, cats, they have the same thing going on where um, XX is a female cat and XY is a male cat. And when we talk about sex-linked, we, we can also say X-linked. Uh, and actually some textbooks and sources you look up call them X-linked. Um, I like to say sex-linked, but it's the same thing. X-linked is a good way to remember it, though, because it's only on the X when we talk about these sex-linked uh, alleles or genes. The Y chromosome is really puny compared to the X. So if the X looks like this, actually, does look like an X when it's duplicated, like the other chromosomes, the Y, oh, so here's the X, there's the Y. It's kind of emasculating the fact that it's so tiny. Uh, but this is what a male would inherit. A female would inherit two X's. So when we actually say, um, you know, oh, here's the genotype for a sex-linked uh, trait, it would look like this. So with, with cats, let's say we're talking about um, the color. This is a calico cat. Calico cats are only female. Um, it's possible to get a male calico cat, but the male has to inherit an extra X chromosome, which, like I said, if, if you look that up in the second genetics lesson, it's not um, a normal male. But for normal sexual uh, chromosome inheritance, calico cats, all female. And here's why. If the, the gene that causes this um, coat color, let's call it C, These are all the different genotypes. So this is, of course, equaling um, the female varieties. With um, the dominant, the, the large uh, dominant C allele, that causes black. The small one causes this orange. Um, so in this case, this individual, this female, is all black. So it doesn't have that calico look. This female is all orange. But this one is calico, where you see patches of black and patches of orange. And the reason why you see the patches is in the average female cell, only one X chromosome needs to be expressed. One of them can become what's called a bar body, which is an inactivated X chromosome named after Dr. Barr. Um, so in a calico cat, wherever you see black, this chromosome is active. It is actually being expressed, and this one is turned off. Vice versa with the orange parts. Um, this is um, the uh, recessive allele on the other X chromosome is active. The other one is dormant. If you're wondering, what's the deal with the white? Why are there white parts? Well, there's this supposed piebald gene that I've read about. Piebald. That can be inherited and it can turn off, kind of have an epistatic effect on both of these alleles on the X chromosome. So neither one of those um, X chromosomes is being expressed in the white patches. So that explains the white along with the orange and the black. Now with males, when you look at the male possibilities, since they're XY, there's only two possible genotypes. Because remember, the Y doesn't have that particular allele. This is how you would write the male genotypes. So this male cat would be black. This male cat would be orange. That's it. You're not going to have that, that patching kind of look uh, because they don't have the two X chromosomes. There's an example for sex-linked traits. Now genetic disorders. Um, the genetic disorders I'm going to talk about here are ones that are caused by inheritance of one gene. Um, 
There are other kinds of disorders, illnesses that are caused by many different genes, and <clears throat> sometimes doctors and scientists aren't completely sure about all the effects, um, you know, so more research needs to be done. But these are disorders inherited genetically. Uh, we know it's due to one gene. The first kind I'm going to talk about are autosomal recessive. So these are not on sex chromosomes. They're on pairs 1 through 22, one of the chromosomes there, one of the chromosome pairs. And it's caused by having the recessive, homozygous recessive case. Um, and it's not always going to be the A gene. Like for cystic fibrosis, you'll see uh, F for fibrosis or C for cystic. First one I like to talk about is cystic fibrosis. This disorder um, has to do with a dysfunctional membrane protein that's supposed to shuttle particular ions back and forth across cells, and it's not doing its job very well. It's not, it's not doing what it's supposed to do. And that causes pooling of fluids because osmosis makes water go to where there's less water by concentration. And since that membrane protein is not shuttling ions correctly, you get pooling of mucus in lots of different organs, the lungs, the pancreas, uh, in, in the nasal cavities, etc. And sometimes the organs get so filled with mucus and so damaged that they need a transplant. So the life expectancy for people with cystic fibrosis is lower than others. Now, if you had two people getting together, so this is a, uh, let's, let's call it gene F, okay? If you had two people getting together who were carriers for cystic fibrosis, what is the chance of them having a child with that? It's 25%. So the genotypic ratio, like we've seen before, is 1 to 2 to 1, but the phenotypic ratio, 3 to 1. In terms of their body in terms of their health. Um, you might say, well, those two people are carriers, but carriers do not have cystic fibrosis. They just have the potential to pass it on. So these three, um, they all are healthy. Uh, this one, that 25% chance um, has cystic fibrosis. Um, if this person, if I change it up, you know, was, was homozygous dominant, they'd have no chance of having a child with the disease because, you know, you would end up having this as the Punnett square. And then there would be no chance. Um, it turns out that cystic fibrosis is most common in Caucasians. And if you're wondering why is that, um, there are various disorders that have trends in, in certain racial groups uh, where they're more common in, in people of a certain descent versus others. That has a lot to do with what's called the founder effect and human migration patterns. And if you watch the evolution lesson um, and, and the human evolution lesson, you'll see more about that. Tay-Sachs disease, let's call it gene T. I could do the same exact Punnett square as I did before. Um, Tay-Sachs disease has to do with um, this lipid-based molecule that cannot be broken down effectively in the person's body. And it's because of an enzyme um, that is not being made correctly due to the wrong abnormal kind of DNA. And that enzyme not breaking down that molecule, the buildup of it uh, causes severe problems, um, especially in the brain. And that baby is usually not going to live past the age of five. So people born with Tay-Sachs don't live long enough to reproduce, but you still have people being born with Tay-Sachs to this day because there are carriers out there. This person is healthy for all intents and purposes. They, they do not show symptoms because they have this allele on a chromosome and they can make that enzyme. But um, this person has a chance of making the homozygous recessive individual. So two carriers getting together. Uh, it's unlikely it's going to happen, but if they get together and have kids, there's a 25% chance their child will have Tay-Sachs disease. Uh, and that's named after the two doctors who uh, discovered it. Sickle cell disease or sickle cell anemia. Um, we could do a Punnett square for that. We'll use A. Let me actually move this out of the way. Just like before. 25% chance of it happening. And this disease, um, I mentioned this before, uh, it makes 
the hemoglobin molecule inside of red blood cells uh, not have the correct shape. And it, instead of uh, red blood cells being nice and round, they look like this. Um, and they don't carry oxygen as well as this kind. They also get caught in blood vessels and, and parts of the body and can cause uh, severe complications. Uh, blood transfusion could be a temporary uh, helper, but they're, con con they're going to continue to make this kind of red blood cell. With PKU, this is known as phenylketonuria. We're going to use gene P for this. Um, that's a mouthful, phenylketonuria, but it's the inability to break down an amino acid known as um, um, phenylalanine. The awesome thing about this genetic disorder is that if there's a test done on the baby confirming that indeed they have phenylketonuria, you can avoid symptoms of it as long as you do not feed the child anything with phenylalanine. So do not give them phenylalanine. And by the way, if you watch the RNA lesson, um, there was uh, a part of the chart, the mRNA codon chart, where you saw PHE, that, that's phenylalanine. So say no to phenylalanine if your child has phenylketonuria. Um, I know that it's found in chewing gum. There are other foods that have phenylalanine. And as long as they don't consume it, they won't display um, symptoms of the disorder, which is uh, amazing. So this is one that you can actually control if you uh, have the right kind of environmental exposure. Autosomal dominant. This means that instead of having the homozygous recessive case cause the disease, all it takes is this. So if a parent has it, it's a 50% chance of it getting passed on. So with Huntington disease, let's use um, H. This individual has Huntington's. This individual does not. The result of the Punnett square is as such. It's a one-to-one -one genotypic and phenotypic ratio. These people have Huntington's sad face. These people do not. The reason why I'm assuming that this parent is not homozygous dominant is because that means that both of his parents had to have Huntington's. It would be very rare for two people with Huntington disease to get together and get married and have kids. Um, very unlikely. So we're assuming he's heterozygous. The mother doesn't have it. The shame about Huntington's disease is that the person typically won't show symptoms until their 40s or 50s, and then it's all downhill from there. You get gradual um, degeneration, the de degenerative disease, progressive degenerative disease of uh, the nervous system. And so the nervous system starts breaking down significantly uh, when they reach middle age, and uh, it happens pretty fast, the onset typically. Um, so the, it's, it's daunting to think about it that if one of your parents dies from it, there's a a 50% chance of you inheriting that harmful allele. Um, and, and I feel like most people would want to know. They'd want to get the genetic test done to see, hey, do I have the dominant for my parent or do I have the recessive? Polydactyly, let's use a P. This is having more than five fingers and five toes on hand or foot. And it is caused by a dominant allele. So if you have uh, a mom or dad with six toes, six fingers... The other doesn't. Once again, it's a 50% chance. Um, there are various communities, um, the Amish community. Um, I've heard of this mountainous region in Spain, a very isolated community where a lot of the individuals have polydactyly. And uh, when you have a small population with very little immigration and emigration, people uh, coming in and leaving, you tend to have you know, more gene flow between um, related families. Um, you're keeping those harmful alleles or the alleles you don't want in the population. Um, so with the Amish community, you do have a higher, a higher um, um, incidence of polydactyly than um, the whole United States um, as a whole. So polydactyly, Huntington disease caused by inheriting one or more dominant alleles. Okay, now if we look at uh, genetic disorders that are sex-linked, on the recessive side, there's red-green color blindness. So here's a test to see if you're red-green color blind. People who can see red and green uh, distinctly 
could see that there is the number 45 in here because they can tell apart the red and green dots. So if someone's looking at this and they just see a bunch of dots and can't see a number at all, they might be red, green, colorblind. And there are actually other colorblindness tests that uh, have you tell apart um, yellow and, and purple, orange and blue, etc. But red, green, colorblindness, one of the more common ones. So the way that it's caused is if you are male, you're going to get that or this. Because as I mentioned before with sex-linked traits, there aren't these alleles on the Y chromosome. So this particular individual would not have red-green color blindness. This particular individual would. On the female side, she is not red-green color blind. She is a carrier and she actually has it. It's, it's unlikely that a female would be red, green, color blind. blind. It's possible. Um, it's just less common than males because she would have to have a father who's red, green, color blind and a mother who's at least a carrier. But with guys, all it takes is mom passing on that particular uh, chromosome because the Y comes from dad. Um, here's an example of that. So here's mom, who's a carrier. And here's dad, who has normal vision as well. So mom is not red wing color blind, but she can potentially pass it on. So here's the Punnett square. Daughter, normal vision. Son, normal vision. Carrier daughter, son who's red green colorblind, and it's because mom was a carrier. So there's a 25% chance with this uh, mating or this cross uh, that they're going to have a child with red green colorblindness. Hemophilia inherited the same way, uh, different gene, different chromosome, uh, but hemophilia is the inability to clot blood. So you have blood proteins that are supposed to come together and kind of form like like a net-like structure that catches red blood cells and, and forms this, uh, this clot that allows you to not continuously bleed when you've been cut. And platelets would help seal up uh, the blood vessel wall. But hemophilia affects those blood proteins allowing you to clot. Hemophilia literally means blood loving. If I were a hemophiliac, I would not love blood, but it just means that the blood keeps coming out. They can carry around clotting factors, or they're going to have to go to an ER if they get uh, a severe cut. So, how does it work? The same kind of way as, as this other Punnett square. So here's an example. Let's say that um, male with hemophilia, female whose father was a hemophiliac, so she's a carrier, Look at this, there's a 50% chance that they're going to have a child with hemophilia. Um, these particular individuals, carrier daughter, healthy male, daughter with hemophilia, son with hemophilia. Um, so those are some punnett squares for these sex-linked recessive disorders. Sex-linked dominant, one of the really, really rare uh, kinds of genetic disorders. This means that just having an X chromosome with a dominant allele is going to give you the disease. Um, so you wouldn't have uh, carriers in this case. And actually, I've read that with both of these, you tend to have cases where it's not actually passed on. Um, there's a mutation, uh, a mistake that happens while the child is developing in, in utero. That tends to cause these. Um, but it, it's possible it, yeah, it can be passed on by a parent. Rett syndrome, the individual um, has um, twitches usually, um, mental processing difficulties. Uh, microcephaly is, is a very common um, trait associated with Rett syndrome. Microcephaly means an underdeveloped brain, literally a small brain. 
Fragile X syndrome, the X chromosome inherited actually looks like it's about to have a part fall off of it where it, it looks like it's, it's kind of deteriorated or it's going to get detached. And so inheriting this chromosome results in Fragile X syndrome. Um, males and females can get it. Um, there are cases where the, um, the symptoms or the traits can vary a little bit from person to person, but mental difficulty, having uh, a long face, um, oversized testicles is another um, characteristic in males. Um, so these are both sex-linked dominant disorders. Thanks for watching, educator.com.